Article 11 of the Justification of Man We are accounted righteous before God only for the merit of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ by faith and not for our own works or deservings. Wherefore that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort as more largely is expressed in the homily of justification. How man may be accounted righteous in the eyes of the all-holy and righteous God is the most important question that can concern him. For the truth of God requires that in some sense what he accounts righteous must be righteous. The doctrine therefore hinges on the relation of the creature to its creator, on the spiritual condition of man in reference to his eternal destinies. It is no mere theological discussion, nor argument of the schools. It is the mighty question, how is fallen man brought into relation with God in Christ, and when thus brought, what are the conditions of that relation? But not only is the question most important in view of its intrinsic merit, it has for us the additional element that, historically, justification was one of the rallying cries of the Reformation. At one particular phase of that event, all other questions became subsidiary to it. The schoolmen had perhaps carried system to its fullest legitimate result. And what followed? The age of the great medieval saints of the earlier school divines and of the great intellectual popes was now past. The Renaissance had set in. The triumph over the Hussites at the two great councils of Basel and Constance had put to silence all public opposition to the church. The 15th century is eminently barren in saints. Men were occupied with the fresh surging of political thought and the sensual glories of heathendom. The classic authors for the scholar and the pagan sculptures for the artist really possessed men's souls. The real leaders of European thought were no longer the pupils of Aquinas or Bonaventure, but Politian and Marsilius Ficinus and the Medici. The higher intellects sneered at those ceremonies and beliefs which they as princes and prelates were paid to maintain. Among the baser sort, the love of the many had waxed cold. But they were in general sedulous in the external profession of religion. Dimmed as their spiritual perceptions were, the belief in the great objective truths of religion remained unimpaired. They continued to place great faith in the external ordinances of religion while divorcing them from their end as means of grace. And so they went on through life in an infructuous round of barren observances till they came to the close of a life of alternative sacrament and sin. And if the deep instincts of the regenerate soul, never entirely faithless to the grace of baptism, did from time to time acknowledge the hollowness of this condition of things, they were softened by an application of the coarsest form of the power of the keys, by the indulgences of Tetzel and his companions. It was in opposition to this corrupt state of things that a potent voice through Europe was heard proclaiming justification by faith, justification in the true sense of the Apostle Paul. It thrilled through Christendom. It penetrated even the precincts of the Vatican. 
and Paul and Contarini and the Theatines felt its power. It was a mighty reaction, and like most reactions, it went too far, nay, ran into heresy. The power got into the hands of the more violent. The truths that God worked objectively in the soul through the sacraments as media between himself and man, and that man responding to grace, whether given in or out of the sacraments, must needs have a personal, immediate and individual relation to God, which had peaceably coexisted in the minds of Christians for 1600 years, were precipitated into the sharpest opposition. Again, St Paul was arrayed against St James, no doubt to the intense astonishment of those blessed beings in their glorious home in heaven. And in reaction against the coarseness of Tetzel was marshalled the coarseness of Luther. But the treatment of the doctrine by Luther soon led into great error. First of all, from his conception of the effects of original sin, he was obliged to eliminate all cooperation on the part of man in the work of salvation. If man be utterly ruined by the fall, the operation of God finds as little response in him as in the irrational brute. Secondly, he was obliged to maintain that justification was only a judicial act of God, whereby the believing sinner is delivered from the punishment of sin, but not from the sin itself. All righteousness is external to us. It remains in Christ and passes not into the inward life of the believer. Thirdly, concupiscence was regarded as subsisting original sin, no distinction being made between feeling it and consenting to it. Fourthly, he had to hold that all sins in themselves, whatever be their nature, accuse men equally before the tribunal of Christ. Faith being the only decisive distinction between sinners in the eyes of God. Lastly, on the ground that the faithful, on account of the obedience of Christ, are looked upon as just, although by virtue of corrupt nature they be truly sinners and remain such unto death, it follows that no internal and essential difference as to moral being is recognised between the converted and the unconverted. The scriptural antithesis of the old and new man, the old and new creation, lose their point and significance. The notion of penitence, whereby the transition is brought about, is mistaken. And the impressive teachings of Holy Writ about a real deliverance from sin wrought through Christ and a real mortification or killing of sin in believers becomes the occasion of self-delusion. Furthermore, the doctrine became dangerous in that it was made to usurp the place of the sacraments, that it swallowed up all the other factors in the life of the soul and was substituted as the ground of man's assurance in place of these sacraments, which not only are pledges to assurers of grace, but which themselves keep alive and nourish faith and grace within the soul. It was emphatically one-sided and imperfect, in that it ignored all those blessed truths that are conveyed to us by St. John, when he teaches us that we are branches of the true vine, each branch partaking of the life and sap of that from whence it springs, the merit and grace and virtue of Christ flowing forth from him into all his members. As there is no source of error, so copious as a misunderstanding of terms, when we proceed to treat of the very important question of justification, it becomes our first duty to define the term. 
In its literal sense, it means a making just or righteous, just as rectification is a making right, or sanctification a making saintly or holy. And this subdivides itself into three acceptations. One, as in human affairs, the word must be restricted to a forensic sense because man cannot alter or affect the heart. The term to justify is sometimes taken for to pronounce just, as when in the courts of law, one who has been tried is absolved from the accusation and pronounced innocent of the crime by the judge. Thus, in the Gospels, he willing to justify himself, or he that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Two, to justify in the strict sense of the term, and with reference to the work of God, is to make just. Thus, St. Paul, contrasting the crimes of the Corinthians before their conversion with their, con with their after condition, says, But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. 3. To justify is sometimes, in Holy Scripture, taken for to advance in justice or righteousness. Thus, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. The word justification is also taken actively and passively. It is taken actively when it is described as the proper work of God, passively when it is described as a certain change in the right hand of the Most High, by which man from being unjust becomes just. Now the second is the genuine theological sense of the word justification. It is a real and not an imaginary process, which takes place in the soul by the operation of God. That process is both external and internal. Man is declared and accounted righteous because he is made righteous. Hence, St. Paul describes the justified state as a change from the state of sinfulness into the state of habitual grace and of sonship, as who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. It is the destruction of the alliance between the human will and the old Adam, the removal of original sin and every other sin committed previously to itself. It is the contraction of a real and living fellowship with Christ, the righteous and holy one. Such fellowship implying the remission of sin and the infusion of sanctification. It is the making over and imparting of the righteousness of Christ so as to become inherent in the believer, who thus, no doubt imperfectly, becomes really just and well-pleasing to God. It restores him to the original righteousness in which he was constituted by means of communion with the second Adam, Jesus Christ. By it, faith, hope and charity, with an infinite power of increase, are infused into the soul, and the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the operation of the Holy Spirit. These blessings, in technical language, may be summed up under four heads. 1. Reconciliation with God, who, instead of slaves, now treats us as friends. 2. The remission of sin, so far as the eternal punishment is concerned. 3. The renovation of the inner man, whereby we who were stained and foul by sin, weakened and diseased, stripped of spiritual goods and half dead, 
become beautiful in God's eyes, members of Christ, so closely united to him, that what is done by and in us is by him in us done. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I merit, yet not I, but Christ meriteth in me. I satisfy, yet not I, but Christ satisfieth in me. For a right and title to eternal life. From what has been stated, it will be seen that justification may be divided into one first, two second. First, justification is that whereby the unjust becomes just. Actively, it is a certain admirable and supernatural act whereby God makes the unjust just. Passively, it is a certain supernatural change by which a man from being unjust becomes just. By this, a man from being hateful and unpleasing to God becomes dear to him. Instead of an enemy to him, his friend. Instead of impious, pious. Instead of wicked, holy. Instead of the slave of sin, the servant of righteousness. Instead of guilty of eternal death, the heir of the kingdom of heaven. The second justification, actively, is the operation of God, whereby he makes the righteous, righteous still, more pleasing, more holy. Passively, it is the supernatural change whereby man becomes still more righteous, still more holy, as it is written, and grace for grace. Having defined the term justification, we now advance to the first proposition of the article, that its meritorious cause is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are accounted righteous before God only for the merits, propter meritum, of our Lord Jesus Christ by, per, faith, and not for, propter, our own works or deservings. And this is founded on the theological truth that he with his most precious blood has made satisfaction for us to our Father in heaven. And having rendered a perfect obedience to him in his most holy life, willed that his merits should subserve to our justification. By his excellent virtues, by his endurance, toils and labours, by his blessed good will to us, he not only has satisfied superabundantly for our sins, but he has reconciled us to God and merited our justification. Nay, he not only merited our justification, whereby we are restored to the grace of God, our sins are remitted, our spirits renewed, and our adoption and heirship bestowed upon us, but he merited one, that the sacraments should have a power of justifying, and that the good works which are necessary to the justification of adults should be sufficient for the purpose, and two, that adults should have grace sufficient for such work. For unless these things happen to us for the merits of Christ and had their sufficiency in him, we could not say that we were accounted righteous for the merits of Christ but only by the law and grace of Christ, who of his great mercy freely appointed these remedies for us, who could in no wise obtain them of ourselves. Whereas it cannot be doubted that Christ has actually satisfied for us ad condignum and merited justification for us de condigno, and according to the severity of justice, giving as he has done more than we owed by our sins, for his life was better than our sins were bad, seeing that his life was the life of God and of man, infinitely well pleasing to God, and his death was more dear in the sight of God than our offences were hateful. 
The next point to be considered is the office of faith in justification. Following the teaching of St. Paul that we are justified freely, the article asserts that we are accounted righteous for the merits of our Lord by faith. Observe distinctly that the article is here speaking of the first justification, viz. that whereby from being unjust man is made just, and that the faith here spoken of is not the fiducia of Luther, the confidence that one's own sins are remitted, neither is it a bare speculative assent to the supernatural truths of religion, such as exist in the demons, but it is that beginning and root of the spiritual life, whereby we savingly believe that God is, that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and that he hath sent his only Son for the redemption of all men without which it is impossible to please him. The hand whereby God's grace is apprehended, the intellectual power of soul which lays hold on revealed truth, the root whence springs the holy life, nay, which is the holy life itself in germ and possibility. It is a divine gift of God in the soul, a supernatural infused virtue. It must be laid down as a principle that this first justification is the free gift of God. We are justified freely by faith as the Apostle bears witness. St. Augustine says, Wherefore grace, because it is given gratis. Wherefore is it given gratis? Because thy merits have not gone before but the benefits of God have anticipated thee. Elsewhere, he says, the grace of Christ, without which neither infants nor adults can be saved, is not given as the reward of merit, but is given gratis, wherefore it is called grace, being justified freely by his grace. This, he says, explaining the words of St. Paul, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? The grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This faith is not mere speculative but practical. Love is its vivifying principle. It does not, however, merit, it impetrates justification. The justifying faith of Lutheranism, however, is not this. According to this system, man has faith when he believes that he has been received by God into grace, and that for Christ's sake, who by his death hath offered atonement for our sins, he receives forgiveness of the same. Therefore no sin can damn a man, but unbelief alone. And the word faith changes its meaning into confidence. The article now proceeds, and not for our own works and deservings. The emphatic word here is for, propter. The antithesis is between the merit of Christ and our merit. We are said to be justified by the one and not by the other. That is to say, our works are not the meritorious causes of our justification. There is no antithesis between by, per, faith, and for, propter, our works. So that the question between faith and works ought not strictly to be imported into an explanation of the letter of the article, although the close connection of the two subjects tempts one to consider their relation. It is clear that the first justification, being the act whereby we are engrafted into Christ, before the justice or righteousness becomes habitual, faith must precede merit, which is the fruit of God, the Holy Ghost, working in those who are already in Christ. It is next stated that the opinion that 
we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort, as more largely is expressed in the homily of justification. If faith is taken in an objective sense, that is to say, as an establishment instituted by God in Jesus Christ, in opposition to Judaism or any human and arbitrary systems of religion, and the modes of thinking, feeling and acting which such religions prescribe, then it is absolutely and without restriction true that faith alone justifies. Thereby alone man is able to acquire God's favour. There is none other name given unto man whereby he may be saved, but only the name of the Lord Jesus. It is only through the mercy of God that this name is given, without any merit on the part of mankind in general, or of individual man in particular. Very many of the fathers affirm that we are justified by faith alone. By the word alone, the fathers never intended simply to exclude all works of faith and grace from the causes of justification and eternal salvation. But in the first place, the laws of nature and of Moses. Secondly, all works done in our own strength without faith in Christ and his preventing grace. Thirdly, a false faith or heresy to which and not to works they oppose faith. Fourthly, the absolute necessity of external works, even those which are done through grace, as love, penitence, the reception of the sacraments and the like, whenever the power or the opportunity to do such works is absent. For then faith alone without external works is sufficient, yet not without some good affections of penitence and charity, which are internal works. Fifthly and lastly, all vain assurance and boasting of our works, of whatever sort, not only those preceding, preceding faith, but those done either externally or internally from the grace of faith. Again, the expression is, though not used in scripture, true and undeniable, if we understand by faith, not a faith segregated from love and hope and other virtues, no mere union of the fantasy or feelings with Christ, no barren recognition of Christian truth or conviction about our own spiritual state, but a new living spirit, a new divine sentiment regulating the whole man, forming an inseparable unity with charity, the very bond of peace and of all virtue, without which whosoever liveth is counted dead before God. While an element of hope and trust accompanies this informed faith, its essence does not consist in an, in an assurance of divine grace in Jesus Christ, nor in a confidence in the merits of the Redeemer, by the power of which sins are forgiven. Neither must we hold up this confidence as being able entirely of itself and abstractedly to win for its possessors the favour of God. This doctrine has no solid foundation in Holy Scripture. And it is a striking circumstance that while this article bears evident traces of having been founded upon a similar one in the Confession of Augsburg, the peculiar symbol of Lutheranism, that a man is justified if he believes that he is justified, an expression which occurs at least seven times in that document, has been rejected from the Anglican formulary. The article in its close sums up this teaching by saying that it is a most wholesome doctrine and full of comfort that we are justified by faith only, and refers to the homily of justification. There is no homily of justification in either book, but perhaps the homily on the salvation of all men may be meant. 
as expressing this same teaching more largely. On this, there is no point of controversy. Any question which would possibly arise must relate not to our being justified by faith only, but to the character of the faith whereby we are justified. And on this all must be agreed. Faith which had not love would be the faith of devils, and this of course would justify none. Faith which had not the purpose of living to God, and according to his law, would be self-deceit. We nowhere expressly read in scripture that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us for righteousness. We read indeed in scripture that faith is imputed unto us for righteousness, that because of Christ's righteousness, God does not impute to us our sins, and that righteousness is imputed to us. But the scripture nowhere expressly says that God imputes to us for righteousness the righteousness of Christ. That the righteousness, i.e. the obedience of Christ, is imputed to us as to effect and fruit, i.e. remission of sins, inherent righteousness and acceptance to everlasting life, that it is communicated, attributed and given to us is in fact said in scripture wherever it is expressly asserted that by the obedience and death of Christ, righteousness and salvation have been obtained for us, or that we have been redeemed from sin and reconciled to God, or when it is taught that Christ is of God made unto us righteousness, or that for us he is made sin, that in him we might be made the righteousness of God, or that by his righteousness and obedience we are made just before God. Yet it would not be safe to say that the righteousness of Christ is the formal cause of our justification. It is more rightly held that Christ's righteousness or obedience, imputed or applied to us, is the meritorious and impulsive cause of our justification. That is, it is the external and objective cause as opposed to an internal and subjective one. If imputation mean the collation of the gifts of Christ, the expression is a sound one. But if it mean that Christ's righteousness is taken instead of our righteousness, that his obedience takes the place of ours, it is subversive of Christian morality. It was said at the beginning of this article that a school of Catholic theologians headed by Contarini and Poe, resting mainly on the necessity of a stronger subjectivity in religion and relying on such authority as that of St. Bernard, had taught a theology in which many elements of Protestant thought existed. A little later also we have Catharinus, Cassander and the eminent Gropa attempting an Irenicon. But logically such Irenicon could not stand. Justification in the Catholic sense as a real though imperfect deliverance from sin or stain was incompatible with a covering of a sin-stained soul with the merits of Christ so that the soul still remains sinful in itself though for Christ's sake the punishment is remitted. It was impossible to reconcile two such contrary theories as one which makes the work of Christ in the soul a real process of right-making and holy-making with a system which consisted merely in a feeling, a reflective act of the soul that it is certainly in a state of grace. Accordingly, a distinct separation took place. Thus we have endeavoured to expound the holy and blessed doctrine of justification by faith, as it has been held in the Church of God from the beginning. 
from first to last, the gift of God, like all his gifts, it blesses mankind by the elevation of every faculty of the soul, consecrating the free will to the glorious service of religion. It develops the notion of responsibility and so puts Christian ethics on a solid basis. At the same time, recognising its absolute need of divine grace in every stage of its process, it renders high praise to God the Father, from whom descendeth every perfect gift. Herein also is the Son glorified as the sole meritorious cause, and the Holy Ghost honoured, through whose potent operation alone we are able to will and to do of God's good pleasure.